Thank you, Sona. Good morning. My name is Bill. I'm one of the pastors here. If this is your first Friday with us or you're visiting, a friend brought you, we are delighted that you're here. If you've been here for 10 years, we're still glad that you're here. We're, we're really glad. I want to welcome everybody in this room, everybody watching online, everybody at Platinum Seating with the Twinkles. Uh, we're just glad we can come together in this Second Chances series that we're in. Before we begin today's talk uh, on Second Chances, uh, what I want to do is I want to pray. I want to pray for us here in the Gloria. I also want to pray for everybody online and people uh, at Creekside where we're meeting as well. So if you will, uh, pray with me, please. God, we are thankful that we can gather here together, whether it's here in this building, whether it's at Creekside, whether it's at different churches all around Dubai, online. God, we are thankful that we can meet together. We pray today, God, as we hear your word, that we wouldn't just hear it with our ears, but that we would understand it in our heart, that we wouldn't just learn more, but that our lives would be changed. God, give us fresh eyes to see what you have to say to us today. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things through the Spirit. Amen. Is anybody thirsty? I mean, there's nothing like water when you're just really thirsty. I mean, there's just nothing when you're craving, your throat feels dry, to just drink water and to be satisfied. It reminds me of someone I think has a very different definition of thirst than I do. Uh, it's, uh, Jose Salvador Alvarenga was stranded at sea in his 25-foot fishing boat. He was off the coast of Mexico. He was going for a 30-hour fishing trip to fish for some sharks and larger fish way off the coast. It was supposed to last just a little over a day. This storm blew him into the sea. And this is what he has to say on his 10th day. He said, when he was talking about getting thirsty, he said, my breaths were getting short. I started to suffocate. I felt like I was drowning and I couldn't get the oxygen. It was horrible. You see, stranded at sea, even though there was water all around him, what he really needed was so hard to find, fresh water. He survived on this raft at sea. He survived on rainwater and raw birds and turtles' blood. And it's a fascinating tale. He was stranded at sea and survived for 438 days. Over a year, he survived. Barely survived. And in 10 days in, this is how bad off he was until he figured out how to collect water to satisfy his thirst. But I'm wondering... If that quote can apply to any part of your life, that you feel like you're suffocating, that you're drowning, that you just can't get exactly what you need. Have you come here today thirsty? Maybe not thirsty for water. If that's the case, fine, you can have one of these up here. But maybe you've come today thirsty for more. You're thirsty to see what will happen in the future, what that medical diagnosis will be or how that relationship will turn out. Or even though you're surrounded by people, that you feel lonely. Maybe you're thirsty for relationships. Maybe you're thirsty for a little bit more self-control. You don't want to have those angry outbursts. You don't want to be wrapped up in that addiction. But you find yourself thirsty for a little bit of self-control. Maybe you're thirsty for your circumstances to change. If only this one thing would be different, that you'd be content. We're going to talk today about where we go when we're thirsty to find true satisfaction. We're going to be in a familiar passage of the Bible. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have probably have heard this story before. If it's the first time you're hearing this story, it'll be amazingly good news for you. But it's a challenge. As we get into this story that we're going to be in, a woman that was incredibly thirsty, 
and found deep satisfaction when she met Jesus. If you've heard this story before, I want to warn you to th- that you would think to yourself, no, this doesn't apply to me because I've already heard it. Because God has a fresh take, a deeper perspective in the story that we have today. We're in a series called Second Chances. So if you're thirsty for a second chance today, you've come to the right place. We're experiencing God's grace, that he is a God of second chances. We've been following along this quote that Pastor Jim shared last week. We've been talking about this quote several times from Alexander White, a famous preacher and communicator. He says this about grace. He says, grace then is grace. That is to say, it is sovereign. It is free. It is sure. It is unconditional. And it is everlasting. Last week, we talked about grace being unconditional. And this week we're going to talk about grace being everlasting because if we're honest with ourselves, sure, we're all, we're all thirsty for something, some sort of satisfactions. We're on a search for something and we find ourselves still longing for more. And so today we're going to talk about God's everlasting grace. The story, that we're gonna, the story that we're gonna be in is found in John chapter four. It's of this woman, this very infamous woman who goes to a famous well. And this woman, you see, was infamous because everyone in her town knew her. They knew of her mistakes. I'm certain she was tired of hearing the whispers of other people of groups that turn their back on her and would look over their shoulder, glaring at her, scowling. They knew the mistake she had made. She was traveling in the middle of the day to avoid most people when they would go to the well of Jacob at the base of this mountain, and she just wanted to be alone and get water. So she makes her way to the well turning her back, being outside of the town that was filled with people that may have whispered about her past. She was unclean. She was a sinner. That she was unfaithful or loose. And she left the town by herself, going to the well where she thought there would be no one And yet, at the well, this hole dug in the ground about 30 meters deep with a short stone wall and a stone lid, at the well was Jesus. And she came up to Jesus. This Samaritan woman seeing this Jewish man, this woman that had quite a past, kind of a dark history, then Jesus does the unthinkable. He speaks to her. This Jewish man speaks to a Samaritan woman. This Jewish rabbi speaks to a woman with a significant past. You see, it was such a big deal that Jesus asks this woman for a drink. It was such a big deal that he spoke to her because he was a Jew and she was a Samaritan and there was a significant history between Jews and Samaritans. And they didn't get along, and they even disagreed on where people should worship, and, and there was this significant rift between Jews and Samaritans. And so for a Jew to talk to a Samaritan was one thing. But here was this man talking to a woman, and Jesus, a rabbi, a teacher, and just by drinking out of the jar that she would have, just by drinking out of that, he would have made himself unclean. And yet Jesus asks her for a drink. Jesus looks past her past and gives her a second chance. So Jesus asks her for a drink, and she says, no, 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 certainly, I can't give you a drink. I can't give you a drink. And then I love Jesus' response to her. And we're going to have it up on the screen. We're going to read it together. And Jesus says this to her. He says, if you knew the gift of God... Who And who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. It's just a, a hint of what's to come. Jesus says, if, if you really knew what I, what I could offer you, you would have asked, and I would have given you living 
water. But she doesn't see what it means on the inside. She's still looking at what this conversation means on the outside. She thinks living water then means water that's moving, water that's flowing, which is much more precious than water that's just sitting in a well. And, and she knows the area, and so she says, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And then Jesus redefines her search. He, he rephrases her thirst. He's going to say, what you need is deeper than what's on the outside. What you need is eternal, not external. It's timeless, not temporal. It leads to thriving, not just surviving. Read with me what Jesus says. He says, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, referring to the well. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up or bubbling up to eternal life. Jesus says, life with me, the, the life that I am offering, life with me, you'll never go thirsty again. It's not just this water that's in a hole that you have to reach down and pull out, that you have to continue to reach down and pull out and reach down and pull out and continue to work to satisfy your thirst. No, this free gift of God, the life with Jesus, this gift of God will result in water bubbling up from the inside, the, a, a, bubbling up like a, a fountain coming out that will lead to eternal life, eternally satisfying the deepest thirst and desire. It's really clear that Things on the outside, changes on the outside, circumstances on the outside, don't really satisfy our thirst, do they? You've experienced it yourself, I'm sure. I mean, you want to know the future, and you say, if I were to know the future, if I were to know just how this diagnosis would work out, what, what this business deal would, would look like, how this relationship would be fixed, if I just knew that, then I would be satisfied. But... We've all experienced it. It only takes one conversation, one email, one message, one decision for us to be thrust back into the fog of not knowing what the future holds. Or maybe you're searching for relationships or you're searching for the approval of others or you say, if I just had one person like me or if I had people like me, if I could just have more people like me, then I would be satisfied but we know that doesn't last. I mean, it, take, it takes one social media post of someone that's critical. It takes one message, one conflict for our relationships to crumble. Or you think to yourself, you know what, actually, I don't need to pursue self-control. I've got this thing handled. I, I, I'm not going to make that ma bad m mistake again. I'm not going to make that bad choice again. I got this under control. I can handle it. But I tell you what, it takes one hard situation. It takes one time of being tired. It takes one time of being hungry. It takes one time of exploding in anger, and all of a sudden, you've lost self-control again. It doesn't satisfy us. The things on the outside just don't satisfy us. And we all think this sometimes. You might think to yourself, if I only had that one item, that one object, that one thing in my life, then I would be content then my life would be better. In fact, this week, you may have seen it in the paper, this week uh, I, I saw something in the paper and I thought that would be awesome to have. This transformer, a real car that transforms into a real robot. Uh, how cool would that be? And only in Dubai is this on the front page of the newspaper where someone has invented a real-life transformer. I thought, finally, I can have my own Autobot. I can fight evil. It'll be awesome. And it's only 600000 That's great. And then my heart was crushed when I read that that was the starting bid of the auction. And so I reached down to pick up the newspaper, and my son, who's much quicker, swoops up, and he grabs the newspaper, and he says, Dad, look at this. And I'm like, I know this is so cool. Imagine we can have our own Transformer. And he says, Dad, if you put your money together and I put my money together, do you think we could afford it? It's like, 
no, son, but isn't this cool on the paper, this transformer? Isn't this awesome? And there's a, some of us, and, and it might not be as extravagant as a transformer. By the way, if any of you win the auction for this transformer, my son and I would love a ride in your brand new awesomeness, all right? I'm letting my inner nerd show just a little bit. But, but there's something about items or objects or things that we think, if I just had that, I'd be satisfied, I'd be content, I'd be happy, I'd be okay. But you know what? You've experienced it too. You buy something, and then you realize it's really not worth it. It really didn't satisfy me the way that I thought it would satisfy me. And Jesus knows that as he talks to the woman. I mean, Jesus knows this as he's talking to her. He says, there's more in your life than what's on the outside. There's something on the inside, a, a change on the inside that needs to take place where you will never go thirsty again. And then Jesus turns to the woman and he says, go call your husband. Tell him about this. And I imagine at that moment that, her husband, that this woman's heart sank because... She didn't have a husband. In fact, that brought up her past. And then Jesus speaks truth into her life like only Jesus knows. There's no way a total stranger would know this about her life. And Jesus says, you're right. You, you don't have one husband. You've had five. And the man you're with isn't your husband. I imagine this woman's heart just sank. That maybe there was this water that would satisfy her thirst, but not now. I mean, not for her. She decides to change the subject, and she says, Sir, uh, I perceive that you are a prophet, right? This man just told her amazing things about her life. She says, Sir, I, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. There's, uh, the well was at the base of a mountain, and so she says, our fathers worship at the base of this mountain. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people are, ought to worship. She brings up one of the, the major issues that she knew would be between Jews and Samaritans. And, and she tries to stir up this issue and to, to, to distract from what Jesus is telling her. And I love Jesus' response to this. I love how Jesus just sees through it and he says to her, he says, woman... He says, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Jesus says, it doesn't really matter where you worship God. What matters is on the inside. This vibrant spiritual life of following Jesus that, that starts on the inside and works its way on the outside. And then these words, as he spoke them, I imagine this woman's ears perked up, her eyes opened just a little bit. He says, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus Tells her, and we know when Jesus died later on in the book of John, when Jesus died and paid the penalty for everyone's sins, he was brought back to life, conquering death. And when, when the hour had come and God's plan to save the whole world ha had happened, and God himself was seeking people to worship in spirit and in truth, she goes, wow. I mean, she, she starts to get it and, and says, wow, you know what? When the Messiah comes, when the Savior of the world comes, when the Savior of the world comes, I'm sure he's going to tell us all of these things. And then Jesus very shortly responds with life-changing words. Jesus says, the one that's talking to you right now, I who speak to you, I am he. That's me. That's me. The Messiah, the Savior that you have been hoping for is me. 
I have come. And th that reality radically changes the woman's life. She eventually leaves Jesus and the disciples. She goes back to her home. And she goes back to her hometown forever changed with the internal truth about Jesus. I have to ask you, have you experienced that life-changing internal truth of Jesus? Have you been radically changed by Jesus from the inside out? Knowing that we are all sinners and our, that sin separates us from God. There's nothing we can do to reconnect with God. But because there's nothing we can do, God sent Jesus to die for our sins. Jesus conquered death. And anyone who believes in him will have eternal life. That life that bubbles up from the inside out, <laughs> satisfying us deeply. It's the beauty of grace is that we are constantly thirsty over and over and over again, and yet God continues to offer us second chances, third chances, fourth chances. Have you come here today thirsty? Are you longing for some, something to satisfy you? Remember what Jesus says to the woman. He says, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. You may be thinking to yourself, I want that. How, how does that happen in my life? W what do you mean? Let me read with you Romans 4. And you'll see that it's about trusting in Jesus, not about earning God's favor. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So if you've come here today and you've never experienced that deep satisfaction in God, I want to encourage you, and I'll we'll give you an opportunity in, in a little bit, if you want to pursue what it means to, to follow Jesus. But if you've made that connection with God before, if you've prayed that prayer, or you've decided to follow Jesus in the past, chances are you're probably still thirsty in some area of your life. I want to encourage you with this, John 7, 37. It says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. We know now that Jesus indeed has been glorified. He's died. He's come back to life. He's been glorified that the Holy Spirit has been given to us. So if you are a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, God himself working from the inside out. Do you believe it? I mean, do you believe that God himself is working in your life right now? Second chance after second chance after second chance. Grace upon grace upon grace. That that Holy Spirit you have bubbling up inside of you. And the question isn't how much of the Holy Spirit do you have? Because we all have the Holy Spirit. Every follower of Jesus has the Holy Spirit. The question is, how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? So as we dwell in this reality, as we soak in God's grace, that we've been given the faith in Christ, that we've been given the Holy Spirit at work in our life, it can radically shift our thinking to where we find deep satisfaction in what will really give us satisfaction. Only a life with Jesus will give the deep satisfaction. Otherwise, everything else is just, well, pretty worthless because it doesn't last. So if you're looking for the future, you may, you may be able to say, you know what, God? <laughs> I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. I trust you in this. If you're looking for that relationship and you feel lonely, 
You may say, God, I know I'm lonely. I don't feel like I have a friend, but I know I have a relationship with you. Or you may be thirsty for your circumstances to change in you. You may say, God, I know that my circumstances aren't changing around me, but I know that the Holy Spirit is changing me from the inside out, conforming me more to the image of Jesus. God, I'm thankful for that. Do you feel like God himself is at work in your life? Because he is. He is, he is stirring you. He is comforting you. He is convicting you. He is leading you uh, out of where you were to where he wants you to be. If you feel to yourself, no, you know what? I'm not good enough for that. I want to tell you, if you haven't learned about the God of second chances yet in this series, there's one more message next week, and you can hear about God's grace again. Because God is a gracious God, a God of second chances. If you've been a follower of Jesus and, and you know God is at work in your life, grace changes us from the inside, but it impacts the outside. In fact, let's look at what happens to this woman. She runs back to her, to her hometown. And read with me what happens to this woman. This woman who was on the outside now becomes an inside. She can take God's news of grace to her friends. Listen to this. It says, Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. God took this woman in her brokenness and used her for his good plan. In fact, I told you about that guy that was stranded on the boat, right? Remember him? He was stranded on the boat for 438 days. He thought when he was on the boat on day 10 that he was really longing for water. He was really thirsty for a drink. But really throughout his time on the boat, he realized he was thirsty for so much more. Sadly, he was the lone survivor, but the journey started with two men. Ezekiel Cordoba was his partner on the boat. And in the whole entire journey, Ezekiel Cordoba continued to tell his friend about his faith in God. And when they were stranded at sea, they would sing songs, and he would share about his faith in God, and, and uh, Salvador would, would say that he doesn't believe or he doesn't know what he believes. And over time, he realized that he was deeply hungry for something more. And although Ezekiel didn't make the journey, when Salvador came back home, he went to Ezekiel's mother, and he said, I now can share the same faith that your family has because of your son. God uses broken vessels to carry the refreshing good news of Jesus to others who are thirsty and longing. Do you think he can use you? Because he can. He, he can use you. He takes us in our brokenness, and he can use us for his good works. God, how God used the Samaritan woman to go back to her hometown and to tell her friends about Jesus and they connected with Jesus and they believed in Jesus reminds me of this uh, great Japanese art form called uh, kintsugi. And kintsugi, it, uh, what happened is way, way, way back there was this uh, a famous Japanese shogun that had a prized tea bowl. He had this prized tea bowl that broke, and he sent it back to China to get fixed. And when he got it back, it was filled with all these metal staples, and it just looked really ugly. And, and he said, there's got to be a better way. So the Japanese developed this art form uh, called kintsugi, which literally means uh, gold, golden joinery, to fix with gold. And so they take, these, they take these bowls and these jars and these pots and when the pot is broken, it's completely worthless for the purpose it was intended for. But the artist would take the pieces, they would join them together with something precious, and the repaired piece of work was worth more than the piece was originally. In fact, it became so popular in Japan, the people were taking their prized bowls and their prized cups, and they were intentionally dropping them, breaking them, 
and they would pick them up and they would take them to a kintsugi artist that would repair them beautifully with gold, and then that piece was worth more than it was originally. Do you see where this is going? In your brokenness, there is beauty because of what God does, not because of what we do. And it's in our brokenness that the world can see God's grace that is beautiful and life-changing. And so your friend that's out there that wants, that wants to know the future as well as you do, you can go to your friend and you can say, you know what, I don't know what the future holds either. But I have a peace in my heart about what's going on because of my relationship with Jesus. You know what? I felt really lonely in my life, too. I thought Dubai was going to be a great world of opportunities, but I, I realized I was lonely, too, until somebody told me about Jesus. You know what? I don't have my act together, either. I struggle with angry outbursts towards my kids, and, and you know what? I struggle as well, but God's working on me from the inside out. In fact, as God works from us, in us from the inside out, we realize the stuff that we do on the outside doesn't match what's going on on the inside. And all of a sudden, we notice that the outside begins to change because the inside has already been changed. The world sees. Everybody sees God's grace at work, and that is a beautiful work of art. So soak in God's grace. Be used as a beautiful, broken vessel repaired by him for his glory and his work. So we have a choice today. If you've come here today thirsty, you can leave, and you might feel better for a while, and you can continue trying to satisfy your thirst in things that won't last. Or we can leave today Hearing God's truth that a life with Jesus deeply satisfies and continue to follow him with a renewed passion because of God's great grace. Will you pray with me, please? If this is your first time here or you've never put your trust in Jesus, I want to tell you that God is a God of second chances. If you want to follow Jesus, if you want to put your trust in Jesus, you can just say something silently between you and God like this. God, I know I'm a sinner. I know my sin separates me from you. And there's nothing I can do to fix it. God, today I put my trust in in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. God, the one who died for my sins and came back to life so that I may be called one of your dearly loved children. Father, there are many of us here who've prayed something like that, who follow Jesus with passion, yet we find ourselves distracted in things that don't satisfy. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, we know you will convict our hearts of what doesn't satisfy us that we are consuming. That you will point us to you. God, point us to you in a way that will deeply quench the thirst that you've created in our hearts. And we look forward to how you could use us as broken vessels to show everybody your great grace. And everybody agreed together. Amen.